And it's a great pleasure and, and an honor to be asked to give this lecture today on drug eluting electrodes and why we are where we are now. I'm sorry I cannot speak in your language, um, but I trust that you understand mine. So this is a long journey. And what is the motivation? The motivation is that there are lots of reasons why we may wish to have a drug eluting electrode. The most important one is for cochlear structural preservation. This is the foundation, of course, for ensuring that the cochlear is not damaged during implantation and for making way for reimplantation and ultimately for therapies that involve both implantation and, I trust, regeneration of the inner ear. Now, the marker for good structural preservation is hearing preservation, in my view, because we can measure it. We can measure it in surgery and we can measure it afterwards. And good structural preservation through hearing preservation has other advantages when the patient has sufficient hearing, and that is that they will hear better in the presence of background noise, and they will also appreciate music better. But from my way of thinking, preserving whatever hearing there is, is the best way of achieving structural preservation. The big issue is delayed hearing loss after cochlear implantation, which tells us that something is happening within the inner ear that is not preserving cochlear structure. Here we see the results from a series of studies uh, uh, done in Iowa with different lengths of electrode from 10 millimeters up to 22. The key findings of this large body of clinical work was that the majority of hearing is lost in the first year. That neither the type of electrode, the, these are all straight electrodes, nor the insertion approach had a significant effect on its prevalence. And also that there were abrupt changes in impedance um, in one in the patients that lost their hearing. And you can see here that there is only complete loss after surgery in a small number, but we find that by the time you get to about years, only about half of those patients that had hearing preservation initially kept it. So the question is why? I'd like to introduce to you the concepts that have guided me through firstly an experimental journey and then into a clinical journey uh, that has tried to understand delayed hearing loss. And this starts with an understanding of fibrosis of the electrode and the physiology of that. Because it's important to surgeons that we understand this so we don't in inadvertently cause fibrosis within the inner ear during our surgeries. So it begins with inflammation and then it moves on to fibrosis. We see here the steps of firstly surgery, where there's initially some bleeding within the cochlea and an acute inflammatory response. Then there's a more chronic inflammatory response and as that occurs, there is proliferation of fibrosis around the implant and in response to the surgical trauma. And ultimately, we, many years later, end up with a fibrotic reaction, but with resident tissue immune cells that are capable of reactivation. So the reasons why this happens is of course, one is surgical. After any surgical trauma, such inflammation and healing will be initiated but also because of a foreign body reaction and an attempt by the implant to isolate the, uh, the body, to isolate the implant. And it is thought, and I will go on to show you the evidence that is starting to support this idea, that we may be able to get another indirect measure of fibrosis from impedances. And this is kind of where the story will end up. So here we, what are the main determinants of fibrosis and 
inflammation and what is happening within the inner ear. For this, you're looking at some images from experimental cochlear implantation. With our typical experiments over many years, we have caused some kind of an intervention, then done cochlear implantation, used auditory brainstem responses to look at the hearing changes over many years, and then looked at the histology. We've done this with many types of imaging. Here we see, for an example, um, a micro CT, beautiful image of an implanted cochlea. But first, after surgery, there is bleeding within the cochlea. I know this because last week I actually had to re, uh, take out an implant within hours of insertion and replace it. There was indeed a blood clot. So I think as surgeons, we don't often see this, but we know that there will be fibrin within the cochlea just through the liberation of clotting factors. And there is often frank blood if there's any trauma associated with the implantation. This occurs, of course, immediately and then solidifies within 24 hours after surgery. So there we see examples of both blood clot and in an experimental animal, the kind of fibrin that will be the matrix for ultimate formation of fibrosis. And this is within a day of the operation. Then of course, we have an acute inflammatory response. So we have an increase in the number of cells coming in to uh, alert the body that there has been an injury um, and to start to respond to that with an inflammatory response. So very, very soon thereafter, macrophages will come in. The macrophages, of course, are part of the healing process and necessary to remove the blood clot, but they are also the cells that will start to invade both the fibrinous matrix and also surround the implant. Here we see an example from our laboratories of a human cochlea where there has been uh, adherence of IBA1 positive cells, in other words, stained for macrophages on the surface of a cochlear implant. This is a well-known phenomenon. But the issue of having the macrophages there and the acute inflammatory response is that it can help to precipitate an acute hearing loss initially by causing oxidative stress that then goes on to kill the hair cells. So it means, in effect, that the more damage there is to the cochlea at the time of surgery and the more blood within the cochlea, the greater the amount of inflammation. And then ultimately, this will put at risk the hair cells. We also believe that the amount of blood at the time of surgery probably determines the amount of fibrosis later, and I'll show you why soon. So we see here many macrophages removing dead cells and starting to clean up this uh, implant trauma and bleeding within two days of surgery in the experimental animal. But then within days as well, we start to get fibroblasts. And here you see at seven days, there are significant numbers of fibroblasts now. And this is the preoccupied, uh, preoccupying type of cell with the macrophages. The take home message here is that the fibroblasts arrive extremely early. They initially are myofibroblasts and then become much uh, more the mature fibroblasts. Um, and here we see, even within a day of surgery, we're starting to get some into the cochlea. Here are the myofibroblasts. They contract to cause the fibroblasts. And ultimately, most of what we see months after surgery is the mature fibroblasts. So three months later, we have the myofibroblasts, some fibroblasts, we have macrophages, and we have immune competent cells remaining. Now, the reason why we believe that the amount of blood clot is, relates very clearly to the amount of fibrosis after implantation is that when we've done serial studies with micro CT and looked at the amount of tissue in the cochlea over time, it doesn't really change that much. So on one day, it's blood. At seven days, there are fibroblasts and some blood and macrophages, but by three months, 
it may be a little less, but there is still a very similar volume. So this tells us that what we do in surgery that determines the amount of blood in, surgery, uh, in the cochlea will lead to a direct relationship to the amount of fibrosis later. In other words, the less damage we do in surgery, the less fibrosis we will end up with. So intraoperative bleeding and trauma uh, from our surgery uh, is going to be a major driver. And then inflammation will, uh, of course, cause oxidative stress for the sensory cells. And this too depends upon the amount of blood present. And therefore, indirectly, it depends on your surgery. So there are a short summary of the steps of fibrosis. So now I want to talk to you about getting down to how we can measure in humans what might be happening. Firstly, um, there is some evidence now that there is maybe relationships between impedance of electrodes and the amount of tissue we are recording in cochleas. With monopolar impedance, this relationship is not always demonstrated and is not always good, but we are finding different types of impedance measurement that are a better approximation to this now. And then what might be a marker that there is some inflammation going on later? Because of course there are immune cells in the cochlea that could be reactivated by any type of systemic event. We talked earlier about transient, transient impedance spikes. And in fact, we're amongst the first to report this phenomenon. Here we see a typical uh, change in impedance over time. Here we see time in weeks. Here we see the electrodes. Initially, impedances are high until we turn on an implant and then they lower. Here we see an average on the right here across the electrode. Now time is going this way and you'll see that for your typical implant electrode, impedances drop and remain stable. But we have noticed that in this, that in some patients, a transient spike of impedance across the electrode is related with objective measures of hearing loss and or vertigo. And you see this across the electrode and here you see it as an average. And you'll see the temporal relationship between this um, and you'll see here another example. Here we have the initial drop in impedance. Here we have tinnitus occurring, a spike in impedance, and then vertigo and objective hearing loss. Now this tells us that these impedance spikes seem to be associated with a major dysregulation of the function of the inner ear. We had the opportunity to explore this in a randomized control trial uh, that has been published last year where we uh, looked to see whether uh, methylpregnisolone would protect hearing during surgery. So this is well controlled data. And what you'll see is that we published this before the end of the trial, but at the time that we did the publication, that three months after surgery, we had 74 patients that we analyzed. Those that had an impedance spike, 80% of them lost their residual hearing. Of those that did not have an impedance spike, 4% lost their residual hearing. At the time of publication, we had 47 patients who had um, uh, at, at 12 months, 10 of these had had an impedance spike and 90% of those had lost their hearing. We then went on to explore in a retrospective study whether this was something just special to the slim straight electrode that we'd studied or whether in fact it occurred with perimodiola electrodes, the CI512. And the short answer is no. These, firstly, there were clinical events associated with impedance spikes, a clinical event meaning dizziness and or hearing loss, but not BPPV. And this occurred with similar frequency in both lateral wall and perimodiolar electrodes. So this is not a phenomenon related to an electrode type. It is much more a phenomenon related to a dysregulation of the inner ear, therefore a change in the environment around the inner ear. And as we have, as we have noticed and has been noticed in Iowa, this is associated with a loss of residual hearing, which 
I think is an acute inflammatory response. And if you remember back to the beginning of the logical flow of this talk, that would suggest very strongly that really what we do in surgery and how our electrode performs inside the cochlea will set up the environment as that may lead to this kind of activity and a subsequent loss in hearing and therefore cochlear structure. So really that is our summary thus far. So what then else does fibrosis do to hearing? Well, fibrosis and means that we will have uh, the chance of scarring up the basal membrane. And let me explain why I say this. All straight electrodes eventually come in contact with the basal membrane if you advance them far enough into the cochlea. And here is some work from Vivine that we published in 2016. These are actually the uh, temporal bones that were used for the FDA approvals of the slim straight electrode. And what we've done here is just marked the green is where there's no contact with the basal membrane. Yellow is a point where there is some contact and red means the basal membrane is being pushed up. So you'll see that with most of these electrodes, there is no actual upwards pressure on the basal membrane, but there is proximity. The blocks, the black line is the point in the insertion where this contact first occurred. And you'll see that it varies very considerably across the cochlea. But once it occurs in almost all cases, but not every case, the contact with the basilar membrane will remain. So now I want to talk, show you a bit, a few more cochlea uh, with fibrosis within them. And this is the method we're using now to look at cochlear implants using whole cochlear imaging. Here's a cochlear implant electrode. We're looking at the uh, macrophages and we are looking at markers, smooth muscle actin of the fibrosis. Here's the kind of imaging we get from this and you'll see we're coming down. Here's the implant, there's the inflammatory response and here we see the fibrosis up against the basilar membrane in these animals. And you'll see that there is contact here with the basilar membrane in this particular animal. And we have reason to believe that this will happen often in humans. Here's another way of looking at this. You'll see that here's the basilar membrane. Here is the uh, fibrous response. Here is the uh, inflammatory, so the macrophages. And the electrode comes in extremely close contact with the basilar membrane here. So we actually looked at all of the human temporal bones uh, in Vivine, which I showed you the slide a little bit earlier. And we looked at the distance, the average distance between the electrode and the basilar membrane. And here is the angle, you know, the depth of insertion of these electrodes. And what you will see here is that when the electrode is further from the round window, the mean distance is about 300 microns. But when you get to about 270 degrees, it's down to about 24 microns. So we're talking really less than half of a millimeter at this point. So what could that mean? Fibrosis is thought to stop cochlear mechanics by stopping the vibration of the basal membrane. And this could occur in two ways. It can occur by fibrosis fully occupying scalar tympani as seen here from Cresnell, or it can occur just if the electrode were in close proximity to the basilar membrane and then the fibrosis over several months um, scarred up the basilar membrane completely. And this has been suggested in a human study where there was a human patient with a 10 millimeter electrode with good hearing preservation initially who lost it gradually over three months. This patient had no acute change of impedance but simply lost the hearing. And here you see the basilar membrane firmly encased in fibrosis. And so here is human evidence that what I'm suggesting may occur. So how can we stop this uh, interference with cochlear mechanics? We can either try to reduce the fibrosis or we can avoid contact between the basilar membrane and the electrode. 
This is where the drug eluting electrode comes in. The steroid uh, that has been studied most is dexamethasone, and here it is. In this can be uh, delivered in several ways. We did ex um, experiments more than 10 years ago, or at least over the last 15 years, where we showed that even systemic steroids could reduce the amount of fibrosis. Um, here we see systemic steroids reduce significantly the amount of fibrosis in an experimental animal. And it did a better job than local and uh, local administration. It was also been shown that more prolonged treatment in experimental animals, here giving uh, treatment for at least a week after surgery, led to a greater reduction in the amount of fibrosis. Also, there is evidence that drug elution of dexamethasone from an experimental cochlear implant electrode leads to a reduction in fibrosis. So you'll see here the various measures of uh, fibrosis, and this is a loose fibrosis, and you can see both that and the total fibrosis is significantly reduced when there is um, drug steroid eluting from a cochlear implant. And these were preclinical studies that set us up uh, to uh, think about human trials. But what are we going to measure in humans? Well, here we see evidence from experimental measures that suggest a much better relationship between fibrosis and impedance. Here, looking at a, a type of impedance called four-point impedance. So it has been reasoned rather fairly, I believe, that lower impedances are likely to be an indication of less fibrosis. That situation is not entirely straightforward. One can't say that just for the patient in front of you, but certainly in clinical trials, this se there seems to be a, a reasonable scientific basis for saying this. And so this brings us to Cochlear's first drug eluting trial, which we did in Melbourne. It was done on the perimodiolar electrode, and it was done with a 40% weight for weight um, dexamethasone from Sanofi that was placed on the spine of the electrode and upon the tip. Here in this um, first in humans trial, we had four, uh, 14 control arrays and 10 interventional. And here is the crux of the matter. These patients were examined for up to 24 weeks, sorry, 24 months, two years. Here we see the impedances, here just simply monopolar impedances, um, looking at the control animal uh, patients. And what you'll see is that after an initial rise, as we've seen earlier, after the implant was turned on, the impedances dropped. But note the basal impedances, they started to rise ever so slowly, as they did in the middle part of the electrode. But look at what happened with the drug eluting electrode. Not only did the impedances drop further after uh, switch on, but they stayed down and stayed consistently down without rising for two years. So this is good evidence that a drug eluting cochlear implant has is likely reducing fibrosis. And if it is likely reducing fibrosis, it may prevent some of that delayed hearing loss when the implant electrode is near but not touching the basilar membrane. Of course, we will need to wait and see on this, but it seems like a very encouraging development. There has just commenced the pivotal study uh, for this uh, drug eluting electrode, of which I have the privilege of being the coordinating investigator, but it will take a couple of years until we get the results. So here we have the major summaries that steroid administration reduces intracochlear fibrosis in animals, that the drug eluting electrode shows that it's possible to get a reduction in electrode impedance, and that it seems that steroid elution is one way which will be able to reduce fibrosis in a cochlear implant and hopefully stop the impairment of cochlear mechanics.
The other way, of course, that we could manage this is by keeping the electrode away from the basilar membrane in the first place. And this, of course, is the design principle of Cochlear's perimodiolar electrode. Here we see examples here of reconstructions of the 6532 uh, electrode from a previous study. It is possible to preserve hearing with this electrode. However, it's not yet sure how we can do this reliably, um, but it is certainly room here for further research and study because clearly if we could just avoid the basal membrane in the first place, that would be wonderful. So in summary, I've spoken to you particularly about drug elution and about the possibility of keeping an electrode away from the basal membrane as ways of achieving better cochlear structural preservation and uh, reducing its biomarkers of hearing, uh, of improved hearing preservation and reduced fibrosis. There's a whole other angle to this, and that is reducing intracochlear surgical trauma, which is real-time ECOG, which we've also had huge success with and just finishing a randomized control trial, which will be published within days that showed that we can, as surgeons, react to changes in ECOG and reduce the um, loss of residual hearing up to three months later. But I'd like to thank many people who have contributed to this work. Um, this has been a team effort, both in our laboratories and of course, with all of our clinical partners. And of course, most importantly of all, our patients and our funders, the National Health and Medical Research Council, the Ghana Parson Rodney Williams Memorial Foundation, and uh, research grants from Cochlear. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Rodari. Like, has been an amazing presentation and all the information that you present is really valuable. And we're looking forward to know more about the findings and the benefits that can that can came from, from this research. Um, we have seen that we don't have questions right now, but if we got it, we will send you through email to you and if you can help us to answer that. So thank you a lot for your presentation and we would love to yeah. have you next time here in Latin America face to face in one of our activities. Has been I a pleasure. We're all dreaming of this, are we not? Um, I cannot wait to see you all as well. I think, you know, we, the world needs to be seeing each other in person again and I thank you for your kind words. <laughs>